If you were writing a title, the title of this message is Dealing with Shame. Dealing with shame. And as we discuss the issue of shame today, I want to acknowledge a few things, kind of give you a disclaimer. I think it's actually important. Um, The first one is this. I recognize that shame is a multifaceted issue, uh, and it touches people all in different ways and different levels. I just want to acknowledge that I understand that. Also, that uh, I'm not going to be able to cover this entire issue in 40 minutes, so I'm just asking for grace because obviously there are all kinds of issues when it comes to shame, like shame cultures, and those. I'm not going to be able to touch a lot of issues and things that might come up in your mind when we talk about this topic. And the third thing I just want to mention as my disclaimer is that I'm, I don't think I'm an authority on this issue. I know that. Uh, I posted something on Facebook maybe two weeks ago just asking people what they thought about shame, and I think I had like 60 to 75 comments, and I had a lot more private messages, and I wanted to say thank you to any of you that are in here or watching that shared with me a story that you've gone through and some of your heart. I really appreciated that. I read everything you sent me. I prayed every prayer anybody asked me to pray and also watched every video, literally every video that you sent me, I watched. Uh, mostly women sent me Brene Brown, so thank you for the re- repeat. I did watch her uh, talk many times and I read or purchased the books that people recommended. So thank you for, for that. I appreciated you being vulnerable, sharing your story with me. But obviously this is a pretty massive issue. I've spent some time sort of looking at and reading and watching, and I think it's such an important thing that we discuss, um, as you probably already know. But as a pastor, I have a unique position uh, and opportunity in the life of so many people that I get invited into. I get invited into weddings and funerals. I get invited into victories and defeats, you know, dark secrets and honest confessions, a lot of heart-wrenching pain. People invite me into spaces that I don't think everybody gets invited into, at least at the amount that I do. And I find that to be a great privilege, but something that I've noticed is the issue of shame is like woven through the fabric of so many of our lives and in ways that we often don't even realize. And I've I've seen this time and time again. It's actually very much a part of my story as well, which I'm gonna share with you a little bit today about. But shame was not always a part of our story as human beings. We see that there's something different that we can read about starting in the very beginning of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, this is what it says. God said, let us make man in our own image according to our own likeness. And we, hear, we see right from the very beginning that God created us to be with him, to be like him, to have relationship with him. In fact, it even says this about shame in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25 after man and woman were created, it says the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. And I underworded or underlined the word felt. It, it see, we see from this Adam and Eve were vulnerable. The word naked, you know, it obviously brings up the f- very vulnerable situation. Couldn't be more physically vulnerable than that. But there was, I, I was sort of wondering why did they feel no shame in this moment? Here's just Adam and Eve and God, they felt no shame. Why is it that they felt no shame? And part of what I think is is that they had nobody else to tell them otherwise. Here they are in relationship with God, and there's no other voice that matters other than the voice of God. And all they know is whatever God says. If God affirms them, that's what they know is the affirmation of God. If God loves them, all they know is the love of God. If God says that's what this is and that's what this is, they have no other voice to deviate them down a different path of thinking. But something very interesting happens also in Genesis chapter 2 is God puts two different trees into the middle of the Garden of Eden. One tree is called the tree of life, and the other tree is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God gives Adam a command of abstinence. He says, do not eat from this tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat of this tree, you will surely die. It's a very interesting thing. And as you follow the story in Genesis chapter 3, what we see is the devil is introduced into the human story. Now we know it's the devil because later on in 1 Corinthians, Paul actually identifies the serpent in the garden as the devil. And so the devil comes and tempts Eve and Adam, causing them to eat from the tree that God told them not to eat from. And as they do that, something very important happens almost immediately as we are looking at this issue of shame. In verse 7 in Genesis 3, it says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. 
And they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves loin coverings. They, they clothed themselves. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. The Lord called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And, and listen to verse 11. And God said to him, who told you that you were naked? How did you know something that I never told you? It's interesting. When they ate from this tree, shame came over their lives. They could see something about each other and they could see something about themselves that they had never seen before. And this is where shame begins in the human experience. And I think it's something that touches all of us ever since that day. I don't know about you, but I can actually remember when shame became a thing in, in my life. I don't know what that experience might have been for you, but I wanted to show this picture uh, real quick, Robin, the first one. Uh, this, is, this is little Ben. Uh, anybody remember the Smurfs? Come on, somebody. Yeah? It's sort of a weird cartoon, right? There's like a Gargamel and a... It's, it, anyways, it's kind of psycho. But there is something about the innocence of this guy right here. I was happy. I grew up in Juanita, not far from here. Had good parents that worked really hard, and, and, uh, and I had a brother and sister. I was the youngest. And I think this is first grade, and this is second grade. My teeth got punched out, as they normally do. Um, but I'm a happy kid. I'm a happy kid. And then something happens to me as I get a little older. Show the next picture. This is, this is Ben. When, when something happened to me in, in second and third grade, I, my front teeth grew in, so they were like buck teeth, and I gained a significant amount of weight, like overnight. So I was always like really tall and really thin, and then I just blew up within one grade, and I came back to school, and people didn't recognize me. But this guy, this guy wore big coats to cover himself. This guy was called names for two years. I can remember for two years of my life, uh, almost crying myself to sleep. I, I felt the pain. Now, I'm sure some of you had this experience, but when I say I was made fun of every day at school, like, I'm not exaggerating. Every day, I faced the same kids, and I didn't have anybody to stick up for me at that time, and I just felt worthless. It's literally what happened. The first couple days, you're kind of acclimating, oh, you're just messing with me, but when you go through years of this, that's why bullying is so, so evil. It's so evil. Our words have power. Remember, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's the biggest lie that the enemy ever sold, right? That's the biggest lie because words can go into your soul and they can do something that sticks and stones can't do. And I learned that growing up. And, and this leads me to my next picture, which is, this is 17-year-old Ben. This is the guy, if you've ever heard me talk about who I was, this guy is not putting on a show. In fact, there are only two pictures of me between 16 and 18 years old. My parents could never get a picture of me because I was doing drugs every day. By this time at 17, I was smoking weed every single day. I went to school high. I have no idea how I graduated high school. I graduated at high. That's how I graduated, <laughs> for sure. I was selling drugs at this point. I was running with different crowds. I was attracted to... The reason I even loved like gang-banging rap music was because I felt the anger in it. And what shame did to me is it made me feel like if you're going to make fun of me and you're going to tell me that I'm nobody, I'm going to make you respect me. That's what I loved about some, sometimes the, or people say in our culture, like, music is the language of the soul. And I felt something in that language. I remember um, the movie Boys in the Hood came out in sixth grade. And I, wasn't, I didn't grow up in an environment where this was normal. I just started gaining friends that wanted to be powerful. They wanted to be, they wanted to control their reality. But a lot of it came from our shame because we felt like we were nothing. And so we had to make something for ourselves and become someone. And this was the only way that I felt at that age and stage that I could do it. This guy was angry. This guy was immoral. I hated people. And it, it unleashed the anger in my life. And so I find myself in fights. I find, I mean, I did not grow up this way. And yet I found myself in a life that God never intended for me, I was never raised in, and I wasn't created for. This is how it, how it happened. And I've since, as, as an adult, I've traced it all the way back to these areas of shame. Shame is so powerful. You know, I heard this, you're not good enough, you're not normal. We might want to take that. Thank you, Robin, for taking that off the screen. Oh, he scares me. Sometimes people will literally see that picture and they'll go, that does not look like you, like your face. I've told the story before, when I gave my life to Jesus, I walked into my house, my dad looked at my face, and I had never told him, he said, you 
you gave your life to Jesus, didn't you? And I go, yeah, how'd you know? He could see it in my face. That's a real countenance. That was real darkness. I walked in the house, said I can see it in your face. That's why we can smile today. But every smile that I had before 19 years old, there was a frustrated tear behind every one of them, period. No matter what, I couldn't be happy, I wasn't happy, I wasn't that first grade kid that you saw. What is it that causes those things to happen in our world? A lot of it's shame. I believe the enemy uses this as a tool to cut paths of destruction, which, which ultimately, hopefully, as we follow out the plan of our life, no matter what the enemy does against us, God is pursuing us relentlessly. And at 19 years old, I personally came to meet Jesus Christ, and I heard his voice in my room. This is why I wrote a, a book called Hearing God, because I heard the voice of God, and God spoke to me, and he told me that he loved me and that he always has. And when I heard that voice, it broke everything else that was trying to compel me to go down this other road that God didn't create before. It was God's voice. And I want to submit to you this morning that I believe shame is a voice. And the enemy uses that voice to try to get us to be and do what we were never made for. It will rob people of their life and God-given potential. And I think it's something that we need to deal with. Even when you become a Christian, it does not mean that this voice goes away. It means that you have to come close to the voice that will always break it and remove it every single day of your life. It's the voice of God. Well, what is shame? Let's look at that real quickly. Before I do, I kind of want to dis describe the difference between guilt and shame because sometimes in the church, we will go guilt, shame, condemnation. People will say it like they're all the same thing. And I I've gotten confused about that, like guilt, shame, condemnation. Is there a difference? What is the difference? So I want to talk through the difference of guilt and shame because they're not the same thing, even though they're probably close cousins. Guilt is the fact or state of having committed an offense, crime, violation, or a wrong it's essentially the feeling of responsibility or remorse for an actual offense. Now, sometimes that offense could be like a societal offense. Like if you drive 80 miles an hour on 164th and you get pulled over by a police officer, he will write you a ticket or she will write you a ticket because you are guilty of doing something wrong. That is true of, of what has happened. But it can also be in a moral sense. And uh, guilt is not always a bad thing if you have actually done something wrong. Sometimes in the church, I hear this, like guilt is always a bad thing. Guilt is not always a bad thing if you're guilty. If you've done wrong, feeling guilt is a good thing, but keeping guilt in your life can be a bad thing because Jesus teaches us a way to process our guilt. So holding on to it in a way where you're carrying it on your own, that will become too burdensome for you to carry. But guilt is not a bad thing. Now, guilt can become a bad thing because... Uh, sometimes we feel guilty for things that we actually didn't do. And so it's really important that we learn how to process this with the Lord, through Scripture, and then with other people. Guilt says to our conscience, you sinned, you made a mistake, you did something wrong. And it would be unhealthy if we didn't feel it at times. Now, shame is the painful feeling arising from the consciousness of something dishonorable, done by oneself or another, that which we perceive as disgraceful. It, the word actually means to cover up, it means to envelop. It's concerned with being rather than doing. Shame says you are no good, you are bad. Not just that you've done bad, but you are bad. You're not enough. It's more than, it's more than behavior. It's about who you are as a person. And they often work together, but shame is more than remorse for something we've done wrong. It's internalized disgrace, it's deep humiliation, it's degradation. It's a blow to our self-worth, self-respect, and self-esteem. And it, it, it's so powerful in, in our lives in, in the wrong way. Guilt is, the feeling, is feeling bad about what we do. Shame is feeling bad about who we are. Guilt is seeing what we have done, and shame is seeing ourselves as failures because of it. Guilt is an awareness of failure, and shame is a sense of failure in someone else's eyes. It's, it's important to know the difference because sometimes shame is a lot harder to come out from under than guilt. Guilt you can deal with very specifically, scripturally, because we know Jesus paid for our sin. And so if we've committed a sin, we know that Jesus paid for that sin, and we bring it to him and we feel forgiven. But there's a feeling that comes, and the feeling's kind of like this, I shouldn't have done that, I know better. And you can't easily as get rid of that because although you feel, you know you're forgiven of that wrong, the feeling that's associated with it sometimes can be a residual that lasts and remains. 
And it's important to know the difference. I think the Apostle Paul, discusses the, when he discusses the outworking of the sinful nature, he shows us the difference between guilt and shame in this very interesting passage in Romans chapter 7 where he actually talks through the sinful nature. And let me just read a part of this to you and show you what I mean. He says in verse 18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing that I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur that the law of God in the inner man But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. And listen to this verse. Amen. I hear you. He says this, wretched man that I am, who will set me free free from this body of death? I feel like he describes the difference between guilt and shame right there. In verse 14 to 20, he shares about the bad that he does, which renders him guilty according to the law of God. I've done bad. I recognize the bad, even though I don't want to do the bad, I see it at work in me, and, it, and I'm guilty according to the law of God. But look what he says in verse 24, he shifts, wretched man that I am. See, the bad that I've done, it means the bad that I am. I, I'm a wretched man. But don't you love Romans 8.1, therefore n- now there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. There's a stronger voice in this story. There's a stronger voice in Scripture, and it talks about the voice of God. Shame is more than a feeling. It's like a voice is what I'm submitting to you this morning. And it's also an echo of that voice in our lives. Sometimes we talk as Christians like we never deal with it anymore, and I have found that's not true. I have found that even the things that we have gone through in our past can creep up in different seasons of our life. It's so funny because Dustin was talking about your 30s in a physical sense, But I actually think different stages in your life will bring out certain thoughts and memories and emotions that you never had to deal with. And so to the the degree that we understand, like maybe today you're free, but you're not actually thinking about some of the things that you will be thinking in a year or two from now, because you'll get into an experience that will remind you of something from your past, and now all of a sudden, you're not as free as you thought you were. Well, you actually are still as free as you were, but now you're having to deal with something else and God will help you overcome that. That's why we're all growing in Christ. And if you don't know that you have a license to grow, let me just tell you this morning, you have a license to grow. You're not perfect, I'm not perfect, we're not all the way there yet, and this life is truly a journey with Jesus in relationship with Him. I wanna do a couple things. The first is I wanna identify shame-based thinking, and we know that our thinking leads to actions, so I wanna identify shame-based actions. And then I want to get to the very important part, which is to move beyond shame. Amen. Number one, identify shame-based thinking. And I think this is the first step in our deliverance. Watchman Nee used to always say in his books that the first step in deliverance is always awareness. It's always awareness. And so here's some of the thinking that we deal with. The first would be worthlessness. And this is where in our mind, we don't necessarily say I'm worthless. I don't think a lot of people actually say that. Some do. Some struggle with that, but it sounds like this. I'm not useful, I'm not important, I'm not helpful, I'm not needed, and I'm not wanted. How many Christians have ever heard that before? In your mind, these thoughts come. This voice tends to make you think that people don't like you, you don't fit in, and you're not like other people. And sometimes we use this as a badge. Like, I'm not like other people. It's almost like a way to excuse the pain that we feel. I understand that, I I respect how we're just dealing with, with things. But this can be a worthlessness mindset. Another mindset would be a failure mindset. I'm not able to do it. I can't succeed. It's it's like an either or type of thinking. Like if you're not smart, then you're obviously dumb. It's this way of of being. And so what it does is, is when you have a failure mindset, you'll actually give up before you ever try. You you understand what I'm saying? Like you'll never try. It will rob you of your taking steps and moving forward in life because, well, if I do, it's never going to work out anyways. The third mindset that I think is something we notice is overly self-focused. Shame can cause us to be overly focused on ourselves and filter how or what we hear from others. Like if your spouse says, or somebody, if you're not married, your, your friend says, hey, I'm just really tired. And you hear it like a personalization, like tired of me, <laughs> right? I do this actually sometimes. 
I don't want to admit it, but there are times where my, my wife will say something, and I don't do it as much as I used to, but I had to identify it. She would say something, and I would personalize what she was saying when she was just being general for a reason. And she would say, that's not what I said, but I'm like, it's what you meant. I said that in my mind. I never said that out loud to my wife, you know. It's a bad thing to do. Isn't it interesting how shame will make you overly focused on yourself, where you will personalize everything? It, it makes us think like everybody's talking about us, and guess what? They're not. My dad used to tell me, nobody goes to sleep with you on their mind. <laughs> he didn't say that in a mean way. He would just say it in a way like, don't worry about what people think about you. They don't. That's the secret. It was like my wife does. Number four is rationalization. Constant excuses, over-explaining, justifying our behavior so we don't have to deal with the root of it, which is shame. We cover ourselves with intellect, intellectualism. We try to be too smart for the pain that we feel. And so we rationalize everything. We make excuses instead of dealing with it. We don't want to ask people if we've ever offended them, right? Because that, that will bring up that old shame that we don't really want to look at. Number five is this word repression is often used. This is where we suppress our feelings and actions. We struggle with denial, which leads to terrible secrets, and it creates a house for our shame as a permanent resident. Repression, we have to learn to feel our feelings. You know, it's funny to me how like the church 20 years ago, and I'm not bashing on the church, I think that's not helpful. But I feel like we constantly we repent for the things that we did that we shouldn't have done. Like we used to think like mental health and psychiatry and psychology and my, we might not agree with all of it, but we used to think that was such a bad thing. And isn't it funny how like mental health and emotional health are so important today and nobody's like repenting of the fact that the church has kind of like pushed that down for so long. We did the same thing with science. We just have to learn to see these things through God's filter and we can enjoy what man discovers. That's the way that I look at it. Yeah, I don't have to agree with everything, but I want to enjoy and discover the things that are growing in, in this world. You know, emotional health is really important. Self-awareness is really important. And can I just say, if you're a counselor or a mental health specialist, a therapist, a psychiatrist, we're sorry. <laughs> we are sorry. If you've ever felt a sense of shame from the church, that seemingly knows more than you. I'm not saying that every line item everybody's gonna agree on, but if you've ever felt that, we're just sorry. And we need you, and we love the fact that you love Jesus. If you're in here or you watch this, we love you, and we need more of you, amen. amen. And as a result of my message, you might have a few more clients. <laughs> Number six is condemnation. You're convicted without hope. This is where worthlessness will actually lead us. Uh, we're, we judge ourselves as unfit for use or service of any kind. It's like a condemned house. Actually, I've worked on these before where a house gets condemned and you go board up the windows and you board up the doors because it's unfit for dwelling and we might get to a place like condemnation is where we look at ourselves that way, like God can't use me. In fact, sometimes when I preach, I can feel it in the room or when, when I preach somewhere else usually somewhere else, right? I can feel it in the room, like when I'm preaching and I'm talking about something inspirational, like God wants to use you and the Holy Spirit will give you the power and, and, and you're amazing, like all of that stuff. I can say all of that stuff, but it doesn't matter what I say because if a person feels condemnation, they just actually take on more shame as a result of me saying, oh, another thing that I have to do, another thing that I'm not doing. It, they, you miss the inspirational part. You miss the fact that God's giving you the equipment. You miss the fact that God is the one that will give you all that you need to do whatever he calls you. We miss all that because all we ever feel is obligation. It's the religious mindset. We're condemned before we ever try. No, I'm, that's not me. That's not me. That's, that's somebody else. See, God uses the people that can step outside of that house and listen to his voice and just start walking with what he says. That, that's who he uses, it's, nobody has to be special. Well, obviously thinking leads to action, so here are some actions that I think we deal with in terms of them being shame-based. The first one is perfectionism. We try to prove our worth by seeking to be perfect, perfect and ways of doing things, and here's the deal, there was only one perfect person. His name wasn't Ben, his name wasn't Chris, not picking on Pastor Chris, he's a little better than me. and Jen's better than both of us. <laughs> so there's that. One perfect person, his name was Jesus. Perfectionism 
can be an enemy. And I know we sophisticate it. I think like our childhood wounds or our upbringing wounds, when we get older, if we're not actively dealing with them, they just become adult wounds with a couple wrinkles on them. They change a little bit. And I hear people say to me all the time, like, oh, I remember when I used to struggle with shame. I'm like, that statement in and of itself is a problem. You don't have to say that. To assert that you never struggle with something, it sometimes reveals a deep-seated insecurity. I.e., I, I give this illustration sometimes. If I told you five times in one conversation, you know, I'll never cheat on my wife. I'll never cheat on my wife. By the fifth time, you're wondering if this guy's gonna cheat on his wife. <laughs> my over-asserting of something that I say I'm not gonna do sometimes is actually insight. Okay, everybody blink. Number two, blaming others. We cover our shame by ascribing guilt to other people. That's what Adam and Eve did immediately. Adam blames his wife and his wife blames the devil and nobody's responsible. All of a sudden, it's not my fault and I'm not gonna deal with the stuff that's in my life. I'm not acting out. It's not me, it's something else. No, it's you, but it might have a root system that you need to discover. Number three is judging other people. So often our criticism for others comes out of shame. In fact, the reason that I'm telling you this message is because last year I went on a journey about possessing an unoffendable heart and I started looking at judging other people and I was repenting like deeply of criticizing people and putting people down, at least in my mind, not necessarily with my words. I realized that it was a deeper issue than I realized or that I thought. And you know where that rabbit hole took me? It took me all the way back to my shame. The reason that I judge people and put other people down and to build myself up is that if I can look down on you, it builds me up, but all it really is is a sandcastle because that thing's gonna blow over at some point. It's not building strong. It's not building on the rock, and I realize that. And so my repentance before Jesus has meant everything for me. Like, for example, here's how it looks, just to be practical. Um, I want to go and get my master's degree, and I want to get my PhD. I, I would love nothing more to do that, but I've got these things called children. <laughs> and for every one of you that figured out how to do that, my hat is off to you, because I have no idea how to even engage in that process. And, and so here's my thing, is like, I, I, I want to do that, I've always wanted to do that, and I feel like at a loss because I haven't been able to. And so every time I'm in a situation where people will refer to somebody who graduated, like has a PhD, you know, they're the honor person or whatever, and they're like, that person is so smart. Here's what happens in my mind. Now I'm being vulnerable, you can laugh with me, but not at me. <laughs> Shame off you, okay? This is what my mind says. Yeah, they're smart at book knowledge, right? See what I'm doing though? I'm protecting myself because I feel a sense of shame for what I wasn't able to do. And they were, and instead of celebrating them, I look, I have to, I have to my mind has to come up with something to make me feel better. It's shame. Why can't I just celebrate somebody and say, they, they're brilliant. Oh my gosh, that person is so smart. I, I don't have to be dumb because they're smart. I like the fact that my wife finds me attractive because I can pretty much build anything. Yes, that's awesome. But it shouldn't be something that needs to satisfy the shame voice inside of me. You see what I'm saying? And that's, what, that's how I judge other people at least. Maybe you don't have that problem in your life ever. Maybe you never struggle with that. Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay, but your spouse might and you wanna to minister to them after the service. You could look over at him on the way home and go, did you feel what he was saying? It was, it was really powerful. I know, I was just thinking about the other day when we were talking. It was just, you know, you were just sharing your heart or you wanted to share your heart. You were thinking about it. I, saw, you were, I know you were trying. Number five is, or four is self-punishment. You don't deserve to be happy. So you sabotage future jobs, relationships. Maybe you were divorced and you feel like, oh, I, I'm not gonna have another relationship because if I, if I do, it's just gonna end bad and I don't deserve that and I'm a horrible person. I've heard this before. We, we sabotage ourselves. Defensiveness, we can't listen to criticism. We interpret evaluation of behavior as a personal judgment. You know, people are out against me. Maybe they're just speaking the truth to you. Maybe, but we can't hear it because we feel so shamed from the life that we've lived. We feel put down instead of helped. And we have to look at things differently because the Lord corrects those that he loves. He disciplines those that he loves. And a good friend will tell us the truth. And we say that, but do we ever ask our friends to tell us the truth? Do we ask our spouse, am I doing anything that offends you? 
Am I doing anything that you don't like that I can do better at? Regularly, we should invite it before it ever has to come to us. I, I'm telling you, it's very helpful. Number six is patronizing. That's deferring your shame, which ends up shaming other people, right? It's, it's condescending. I'm the have, you're the have not. I look down on people. Anyways, number seven is controlling. I know I'm hitting these like a, it's really quickly, but I kind of have to. Number seven is controlling. You seek to control the thoughts and the actions of others, which will, by the way, in many cases brings abuse, physical and verbal and emotional abuse, because we try to control people. You can't control people. God doesn't even control us. He could, but he, he gives us choices. And number eight is arrogant behavior. That speaks for itself. But number nine, addictions. We don't like the way that we feel, and so we want to feel differently. This is what drove this 16-year-old Ben. Actually, I started when I was 13. I started using drugs and abusing alcohol when I was 13 years old. And it's a long story, but suffice it to say, I can remember the first time that I did it. It made me feel better, and my pain just went away for an hour. And I wanted to feel that way again. And you know, I used to, God broke me free of a lot of addictions. But what's interesting is it's not only drug addictions. People have alcohol addictions. You, do you know more people are killed in the USA as a result of abusing alcohol than any, all of these other addictions combined? And we, Bridget and I have had friends, and they start out drinking socially. And I'm not against drink. You drink wine and beer and you enjoy that. That's, that's not a sin. But you obviously need to know when it's altering your behavior, when it's changing you, when you act differently if you don't get, you have to know these things about yourself. You have to become self-aware where you're abusing something. Television, the average American spends two hours a day on television. Sometimes we use that to medicate ourselves, to make ourselves feel better. I don't wanna deal with the things that I wanna do. There, in this room, God has called us to do all of these things, but there are times where we never get around to it because we are entertaining ourselves which medicates how we feel instead of getting on with the hard work. And if you realize that it might be a root of shame, you can uproot that and start working on the things that God has about in your life. I'm not gonna live out of my shame and try to medicate myself to feel better. It's not worth it. I want to be used of God in this life to do whatever he's called me to do. But you gotta get honest with yourself to do that. We've gotta see that we're medicating ourselves. Pornography is a plague in our generation. Working out, sports, spending, all of these things can become addictions to make us feel better about ourselves because we don't feel good about ourselves. I never, I didn't grow up with this, in this environment that pointed me towards drugs and alcohol. I just hated myself. I hated how people made me feel and those things made me feel better. That's why, and then before you know it, the anchor's in you and you can't stop. I have a lot of compassion for people in addictions. And if you don't, you should. Because nobody grows up wanting to be there. Nobody. Nobody, nobody that, two, that second grade kid that you saw, a smile on his face, I did not want to be that 17 year old kid. It's not who I want to be. And nobody wakes up wanting to be like that. Nobody. And it deserves our compassion. It deserves our compassion. Everybody's story matters. It matters so much to us. It should. And it matters to Jesus for sure. And so we've got to be careful that we're not living out of things or even looking down on other people for doing so. We're, we're, we're a presence of life and love and freedom and flourishing in the world. That's what Jesus was, and that's who we are. How do we move beyond shame? The first is that we come to Christ. He's the only one that lived a sinful life. He is perfect. His life in exchange for our life, he forgave our sins by going to the cross and by resurrecting from the dead, he offers us new life. And we can live a new life without shame because that's what Jesus paid for on our behalf. That's awesome. This is what he said to those that were following him in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You want rest for your soul? That inner turmoil? You say, Ben, I know Jesus. We got to come to Christ every day. Salvation is, it's not just getting saved and I'll be with Jesus one day, but like he said, I'll give rest for your soul. If your soul's not at rest, he can help you, help you with that. He can help you with that. Number two is engage your relationship with God. God's not, not looking for a better performance from you. He's looking for a better relationship. John 15, I think it's 15, says, Jesus says to his disciples, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. Right? Because a servant is not aware of his master's business, but I want you to be aware. I want you to walk with me and be like me, and I want to do this life with you. That's profound. Jesus wants relationship with us. I call you friends. 
Everything that we need is found in an intimate friendship with the Son of God. And, and the proximity that we have to him matters. And I know what happens in sort of the religious mindset is that we get into this space where it's all obligation. Like, well, I don't know about reading the Bible. It doesn't really make sense to me. And I don't know about praying. And I'm, I'm either consistent or I'm not consistent. And that's really what it's all about. And my goal is not whether or not I pray consistently. It's that I pray, it's that I enjoy praying consistently. Because it's relationship with a person. It's what it's about. It's what he is drawing out of us. So, so many times we, we kind of have this shame mindset, even in church, where it's like, I have to instead of I get to. He commands me instead of he invites me. And I, 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 I he, listen, he does bring commandments. I'm not taking that away. But his commandments, everything that God says is for my good, period. He made me. He knows what I need. And all of it is for that purpose. And there is no reason to preach down on one another. The command of God says this is because you cannot enforce a response from God. If you could, we would, all of our kids would be saved, sanctified, delivered, you know, and they're walking around little sinners, you know, they're doing problems, got issues. I would have never gone down that road if you could coerce and force someone to respond to God. You can't. It's something that God does from the inside out. This relationship with God is powerful, and the proximity that we have to him and his voice is the degree in which we overcome the shame, which is a competing voice. It's a competing voice. It's always trying to push us to do more and to try harder and to get it together in other people's eyes because you don't have to do it in God's eyes. I I love it. I tell people when, when we look at our prayer class, I go, when you sit down to pray, Don't think that you're trying to get somewhere with God because you're already there. There's nowhere to get. You're already there. You can't impress him. I mean, like, there's nothing that you can do, but he loves and enjoys us. It's what he longs for. I mean, it's either true or it's not. That's Christianity or it's not. He went to the cross to prove all this. I mean, it's amazing. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, so we want to enjoy and engage our relationship with God. The third is to remove the mask that shame has made. We've got to be honest with what's going on in our lives. God works with us where we actually are, not where we think we are, not where we want to be. And you got to, I mean, it, it, sometimes it's hard to come into the bright lights. I, I've had many stops of maintenance along the journey of my life where I had to come into the mirror and finally admit the thing that I wasn't intentionally hiding, but I didn't realize was covered up. And I, and I had to do that. One of the things for me was when I married my wife and I adopted her two boys, she was a single mom and they have two different fathers. I had a struggle with one of them for like years, years. Chris knows this, there's very few people that know this and I won't dishonor anyone by sharing the story, but I can just tell you, I mean, I went to counseling, I went everywhere, I couldn't change my reality and you know what it did? All it did is make me feel like I'm a bad Christian, I shouldn't be in ministry, I'm a horrible person because I can't change this reality that I'm living in. And God spoke to me, and he said, I'm not asking you to change the reality. I'm asking you to follow me in the middle of it. And it changed everything. I think I exhausted the counselor. I remember one day where he just looked at me and said, Ben, you already know everything you need to know. (laughs) You know? But I also didn't understand classic abandonment reactions. You know, what happens to young people when they're abandoned? I I read a bunch of books, and I've come to understand things that I didn't understand. But my point is, is that you have to take the mask off. You have to take the mask off. You've got to learn how to be honest. We've got to learn how to be honest. God wants honesty. He can deal with it. He actually already knows everything anyway, so there is that. Being vulnerable is powerful. Number four is break agreements with lies. We know the enemy. It's not just self and people and events, but the enemy would love nothing more than to draft us in to these lies that he wants us to believe that I've already described. You know what I think about this? I think that this is spiritual warfare, talking about this. I was a part of a deliverance ministry for about two and a half years, and we would talk about things in ambiguous terms, and we would pray things in ambiguous terms, and I realized that these kinds of things are spiritual warfare, where you can actually describe the feelings that people are feeling. And sometimes going to a counselor or or a Christian counselor, psychiatrist, whatever, will actually help you to put words to the feelings that you have. I just feel like some of us, there are people that you'll stay stuck. You need to be able to go and be honest with someone and break the agreements that you have with lies, the things that you repetitively say over your life. That's where we invite demonic lies and spirits into our life. 
They're not like knocking on our door at Halloween with horns on their head. They're transmitting lies that we would live a destructive life and never have any effectiveness in Jesus at all. And the last thing is believe the truth. And there's a scripture that says, he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. That we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Like this is what he says about me. And uh, Sherry, if you would come. I'm gonna, I need to conclude. I'm already, I've, I've dragged you over time a little bit. But I want to show you a picture as I close. This is a picture that I found here. Um, here's what this is. This is an oil on canvas painting of a teenage boy holding a pipe. 39 inches tall, 32 inches wide. It's kind of a strange picture to me. And uh, I just was wondering, anybody, would any of you guys like this on your mantle? <laughs> no, I, don't, I didn't think so. It was painted in 1905 by a 24-year-old artist in Paris, and his name was Pablo Picasso. It comes from a rose period. He actually had a period of time where he would paint a lot with roses. I'm not sure why, but in 1950, this painting was, was sold to a wealthy American for 30 grand. But in 2004, it was resold for $110 million. And during that time in 2004, it set the record for any painting ever sold, $110 million. But here's the question. Is that worth $110 million? I mean, I don't know if you've been reading the stories about Hurricane Michael and the devastation and the Florida Panhandle or whatever, but think about $110 million, what it could do for the cleanup. Think about how many homeless shelters it could build. Think about how many missionaries it could support. Think about all the things that $110 million could do. And you look at this and you just go, is this, is this worth $110 million? And if you're like me, you probably say, but here's the actual answer. This and anything else in life is always worth what someone is willing to pay. And it doesn't matter what I think about it, and it doesn't matter what you think about it. it, it matters what that person with $110 million thought about it. And they thought that it was worth $110 million. So the real question is, what are you worth? What am I worth? The Bible says that Jesus paid an eternal price by giving his own life for you, and for me, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says that we were bought with a price. The life of the Son of God. He paid an eternal price. Doesn't matter what any other voice says that you're worth at all. What matters is what the voice of Jesus says that we're worth. And the value that he brings to us is, is not fathomable. It, do, it doesn't make sense and it never will. That is why our hands go up. That is why we worship. That is why we're here on a Sunday morning. That's what woke us up this morning, and that's what gives us peace when we go to bed at night. It's the voice of Jesus Christ that says that we're valuable. Amen. When I came to Jesus at 19 years old, and I was fighting off all these voices that told me that I was worthless, I had some people that affirmed me that said I was good, but it's amazing how voices of shame can actually take out all the other affirming voices in your life and make, it, make you think that that's the only thing that matters. I remember there were people that told me, and this is a true story, they told me, what do you think, you're better than us? All these voices that tried to make me feel bad, and they probably did it out of their own shame, isn't that true? What do you think, you're better than us? And I can remember then, and I can remember now, I, I looked them in the face and I said, I don't think I'm better than you, I just know I matter now. I know I matter because of the voice of Jesus. He told me that I mattered. I don't feel better than anybody. It's not what this is about, but we matter. And if not to everybody else, this is all we need. This is the first and the most important voice that we need to tell us that we're valuable and we're worth something to him. He loves you. He loves me. And that sets the trajectory for the rest of our life. And every other voice that tells us something different, it might be painful, I'm not diminishing that, but it's not as strong as the voice of Jesus. This morning, I'm calling you to your relationship with God where that voice shatters every other thing that you'll ever hear. It will shatter it. If not today, tomorrow. If not tomorrow, next week. Stay close to the voice that matters the most. Amen. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you this morning for the power of the cross. We thank you that you rose again. You give us new life. And we honor you this morning because your voice is what matters. And God, some of us are in deep pain. We've been experiencing it for our whole life. Some of us have dealt with that. Lord, we thank you for the victory that we have in you. We thank you for the victory that we will have in you. We thank you that you broke the voice of shame and that your power overcomes every other power in our life. Even if we're going through great difficulty now, we lean into you, we press into you, and we ask, Lord, that you would speak life to our hearts. Help us to see why you went to the cross and the way that you look at us this morning. And let that break every other thing that's causing us to react and act in ways that you didn't create us for. We love you and we look to you this morning. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Sherry, take us. Thank you, Pastor Ben.